On this episode of Cars with Corey, we are back for part two on my 1998 EasyGo TXT stereo installation. Last time we got the head unit in, we didn't have enough time for speakers, so we're going to work on that today. We're also going to go over in detail how I wired it with an external 12 volt battery. Some of you who watched the last video had some questions on that, so we'll clear all that up as we kick off. Mentioned in the intro, we're going to go over how I wired this in with an external 12 volt battery independent from the golf cart battery system. I started to draw things up. I did a couple of renderings, but I found it actually easier to just go ahead and wire a miniature version of it. So starting off with the positive side, um, I used orange. I have literally a thousand foot spool of orange, so I use a lot of it. But uh, it, for, the de for a demonstration here, orange is always getting 12 volt power. I do have a red wire here. That one is gets 12 volt depending on switch, and then obviously black is for negative here. So. Uh, again, miniaturized version of this. I got a stereo and a, a little speaker here just for testing purposes, but uh, the important things to know, uh, these things are very simple. There are three main wires you need to get this thing to fire up. You have a red wire, which in a car or other application typically comes off of the ignition switch. So when you turn the ignition off, you get a 12 volt signal here, it tells the stereo to power up. You have a yellow wire, yellow wire uh, will typically go directly to the battery. This gets a constant 12 volt. Again, uh, orange represents what has 12 volts at all times. Um, and then you have your black negative. And those three will get the stereo to fire up. There are other wires. I'm not going to go through those in, all, in tons of detail, but obviously speaker out. I just temporarily have my little temp speaker uh, hooked to one of the front channels there. So getting started here, uh, <clears throat> again, orange goes to a fuse holder. Normally I would run this like literally right there. Again, run your fuse as close to the positive terminal of the battery as possible. Uh, but we go in and out of the fuse. So here we go into the switch. So 12 volt goes in on the positive leg of the switch. I split it there and ran it out to the constant power of the head unit. Um, and then the output of the switch in red here, once we flip the switch on, that will turn on and essentially uh, emulate the uh, turning the key on. So uh, this will, when you, when you flip that switch off, that cuts it off. It just, the stereo uh, keeps what it needs to keep uh, radio stations and settings saved, but it is not constantly drawing power in this configuration. And my switch is lighted, so I actually ran negative into the switch. So you can tell when it's on, uh, it lights up the little light. So negative's pretty simple here, you know, go directly into the switch. If you didn't have a lighted switch, you could essentially just go right to the radio. So uh, we have a 10 amp fuse in the fuse holder here. So uh, using the switch here, I flip this on, that should light up that switch. And as of now, we have turned on 12 volts to emulate the uh, ignition and we have power at the stereo here. So, um, that's how I did it. Pretty simple. As uh, those know, watch the last video. The switch is pretty close to to the uh, to the driver's uh, spot. So uh, I, r I really only ran the positive and negative uh, the majority of the way. And then essentially behind the dash, there is the switch and kind of where it splits and all of this wiring exists exists behind the dash. There's not a reason to run multiple wires from the battery. A little bit about the wiring tools I use. Uh, some of these I've had for years and years. Uh, other ones uh, picked up along the way, but I started off with kind of the combo one here. It works. Uh, you can strip the wire down here, which works somewhat. Uh, somewhat. You put it around the wire and you kind of have to twist it around the wire to get it to strip. These things are incredibly cheap. They also uh, crimp up here. And I believe these are cutters for different uh, different sizes of like bolts, like teeny tiny bolts. You can actually use these to snap them off in different lengths. Um, and it has a uh, one here for, I think these are like spark plugs and then you just have a plain cutter. These things work if it's what you have, you can use it. You might struggle a little bit. I'm a little leery of the crimper. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe 80% of the time it works, but uh, I have a better crimper that I'll show you, not a whole lot of money. Uh, this is just more of a stripping tool. I like using this one for actually for house wiring. If I'm wiring an outlet, this one works really well. I just pop it in there and these are super sharp. So uh, they strip the coating off the wire pretty easily. So 
Uh, having a set of nippers is nice. I like these little teeny Craftsman ones. They're super sharp. They do a really good job. Um, I've had you know different versions of those for years, but I really like these these tinier ones. You can buy the you know the cheaper ones. The Harbor Freight ones are just really not very sharp, and they tend to be super duper tight. Whereas these spring back, which I really like too. Sometimes I cut uh, if I'm tying up wires, have cutting zip ties and the the tail end off of those. You can get it up in there, and it's not gonna like. You know, it'll spring back open and you kind of shove it in there. If you don't have a lot of room for your hand, cut it off. So cable cutters, these are real nice for you doing amplifiers. Um, these tend to, uh, this is I think my third set of these. This is a cheaper one. My original set was Mac or Snap-on or something like that. But uh, you can cut big, big uh, gauges of wire with this. Like if you're doing amp wire, like four gauge or two gauge or aught gauge or double aught or whatever you're doing. You can also use it to uh, strip the coating off, uh, you know, just kind of get it around it loosely and this will, if they're sharp, a uh, key piece being uh, keeping a sharp pair of these, uh, you can uh, strip the wire off of your amp wires pretty easily. So over here are probably my two favorite wiring tools here, particularly for 12 volt wiring. I've had these for years. Um, these stripping tools, there are different, differing levels of, of quality in these, you can certainly buy a pair of these for Gosh, I think at one point they were down to just a couple of bucks at Harbor Freight. Um, <clears throat> my set here, uh, I have probably literally stripped uh, the coating off of 50,000 pieces of wire in my life with these. Um, they still work. Uh, they're pretty amazing. They, they have a little bit of adjustment for gauge. Uh, they have kind of a length adjustment on the jaws here so you can see about how much wire you're stripping off. I've used these just tens of thousands of times, they still work very reliably. Uh, this is a Thomas and Betts style uh, wire nipper and it actually has the jaws in there for crimping, um, to crimp your butt connectors or your uh, whatever type of removal connectors you're using or bell caps or whatever. These will crimp, I've had very few of these, I've probably, probably uh, aside from stripping that much coating off of wires, probably half as much, 25,000 times I've crimped with these, uh, they work flawlessly. The uh, opposing coated handles tells me which side the, uh, the boss is on there for crimping, so I always keep the orange. I know the orange is where I'm really pressing into it, so that's handy too. I have cheaper sets of these. They work just as well. I've just had these for years. Um, gosh, when I got these, I bought these off tool truck probably over 20 years ago. These were incredibly expensive. They were new at the time. We're talking early 2000s, like 2001, 2002. I wanna, I wanna say these were like $100 and these crimpers here were probably like 80 or 100 too. So a couple hundred bucks, I'd say I got my money's worth out of them, but you can use any of these tools if you're using crimp type connectors. Um, obviously you can solder things too. Uh, guys, I wouldn't recommend doing the, you know, strip and twist and uh, black tape. If it's what you got, you can certainly do it. Um, just get that tape really tight. Um, tape it up really, really good so it's not coming apart, but that's got to be a last resort. Not only use it for temporary. At minimum, you want to use some si some type of a crimp connector. Make sure you get it crimped really good. I recommend these. I think you picked these up for 15, 20 bucks now. They were pretty expensive in their early days. And you can get a set of strippers like these. Secondary, I would say a set like this. These are really sharp. Wouldn't use this guy unless you absolutely have to. You certainly can take a wire and take a knife, or I wouldn't recommend stripping it with your teeth. You do enough of that, you end up with a snaggle tooth. Ask me how I know. Uh, but all of these tools will work. Um, my recommendation would be, um, these come in differing quality, like I said. I don't know if I would buy any set of these. This is the Tool Aid brand. I checked it out on Amazon. They still sell these. They're not 80 bucks like they used to be. I'd recommend this one. This one has worked reliably for me, like I said, for 20 years. I don't know if I'd recommend any of the other ones, but these can be a little harder to find. This guy here, you can find at any hardware store pretty much in America. This GB, I believe I got this from Menards or some home store, but this guy does a pretty good job. Those, those, uh, those are really sharp. So uh, a little bit about the tools used. Uh, next, we're going to go over to the connectors and connection types. So we'll start off with Scotch locks. Um, these guys are usually included in trailer wiring kits. Uh, I wouldn't recommend these to use outdoors. Um, they work, I'll use them occasionally. If I'm tapping into a wire uh, underneath the dash of a car that's pretty tight, these are convenient, they do work, okay? Um, 
if you're doing something that's going to be outside, exposed to weather, humidity, would not recommend these whatsoever. Uh, seems to be a little confusion on how you're actually supposed to use these. If we can see it on camera there, probably not. One of these uh, holes through it is all the way through, and one of them has a stop, and I'll show you why. These are actually designed to tap into something. So let's pretend for a second here that this black wire is a continuous wire, and let's just say it's underneath the dash, and you're looking for to tap into a lighting system, say like for your parking light, so you can light up uh, an aftermarket gauge or something like that. So uh, how these actually work is you, you snap them over an existing wire, so you actually feed them in through the edge here, you get kind of a positive click, and now this guy will slide along the wire, and then what you do is you tap in, so we'll pretend this blue wire here is going to go to the gauge, you actually shove it in the opposing hole right behind it there, all the way in until it stops, and then there's the metal piece down here, and I'm not going to do it, but you would take a pair of pliers and essentially just push that down, and what that does is that cuts back the coating off of the wire and it makes a connection between the two wires there. So you can use these for certain applications. Um, it, I think they have their place outdoors, absolutely not. We've got a lot going on here, but I'm gonna go through the different types of connectors that I use or are common. We did just touch on scotch locks. Again, I think those have their place. Uh, bell caps, if you take and twist two wires together, uh, you can use the crimpers, crimp these down. Uh, a lot of people kind of hate on these things. I'm sure there's cars with car stereos that I installed 25 years ago that are still running on those. They have their place, they're cheap, they're easy. Um, I use them from time to time. You saw in the demonstration I did use them where they connected to the radio harness. They work. Um, again, neither of these outdoor use, uh, but in a, in a pinch or if it's what you got, depending on what you're doing. I mean, you can certainly add some tape, you can add some shrink tube, we'll come back to that. Uh, but they can be used. Uh, probably, I would say, more than 75% of the wiring I, I do gets done with butt connectors. Um, these guys work uh, outdoor use, I would cover them in shrink tube, again, we'll come back to that. They do make these that have shrink tube attached to them uh, to keep uh, you know water, moisture, things like that out. Um, I just use the standard ones. I'm able to buy these type at bulk and then I'll, if it's for outdoor, uh, I will go ahead and use shrink tubes. So there's also solderless uh, connector types. Saw some of those in the earlier demonstration. There are shielded and unshielded. So uh, choose for the right application there. Uh, I use unshielded ones for the demonstration just because that's what I have the most of. But normally in an application where things could touch, you want to use a shielded one. So. And then kind of the new kit on the block here, we have these solder type, heat type uh, term, uh, connectors here. So these guys, you twist the wires, put them in, or I guess put them in, uh, and then you heat them. So what I found out with these is that uh, it really depends on uh, where you're applying them and how you can apply the heat. If you're deep underneath the dash and all you have is a torch, do not use the torch to heat these. As a matter of fact, think twice about using them all together. If you're close to other wires, you do not want to burn or melt coating. Um, these would be perfect for making a splice in, say, like a, a trailer wire connection or something that's out in the elements that you can get at pretty easily. If you can't get at it pretty easily and not risk starting a fire or burning or melting other things, don't use these. Use butt connectors or if you, if you want to, you can try to solder if you have enough room in there. I found, don't use a lighter, don't use a torch on these. You can, if you're careful enough, you have enough space, use a heat gun. Uh, just a cheap heat gun. I bought this years ago. It's my second one. My first one broke years ago, but uh, cheap heat gun. Um, I imagine you could probably use a blow dryer or try to. I don't know if it get hot enough. Heat guns get much hotter than blow dryers. And then, obviously, uh, rosin core. Make sure this is rosin core, flux cord, uh, wiring solder, not plumbing solder. There's a difference. And then a good old uh, soldering iron here. Mine's just a cheap one. Uh, all, both uh, these, This will do the trick too, but again, it depends on the application. Sometimes I'll solder, sometimes I'll use any of these connectors. Uh, I don't typically twist and wrap with electrical tape. Um, that's something in my youth that I learned uh, hard lessons on. So I always keep a good selection of shrink tube around. This is not all of it. This is what I happen to grab. 
I buy most of mine at Harbor Freight. I do buy some in bulk if you're near a larger city, micro center. It's kind of a computer uh, part store, among many other things. They have a fine selection of different colors of shrink tube. Um, pretty middle of the road. You can imagine you buy this online, Amazon, wherever you choose. So uh, the smaller tube pieces here came from Harbor Freight. These come in just a package. This is just an example. Uh, if you just have a small job, you just want a few. You can also buy spools of it um, in different sizes. I got 5 16ths. Actually, both those are 5 16ths, 8 foot long. And then there was a box for this, but this, I believe, also came from Harbor Freight. There's kind of a multi-pack with different sizes. So cut that stuff the length, put it on the wire, then put the connector on, then crimp the connector, and then heat it. If you forget to put the shrink tube on, you got to take it apart and do it all over again. So like I said, there are many different methods of connecting wires. Um, there are probably more. These are the common ones that I commonly use. It all depends on the application. I do use scotch locks. I use bell caps. I use butt connectors. I use solderless connectors. I use this type of solder connectors, and I will obviously solder wires together uh, directly sometimes to a shrink tube. Just about all these I use shrink tube, definitely if they're outside, um, but if they're uh, inside behind the car stereo, um, I believe I actually use bell caps on, on the easy go here just because uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's up underneath the dash. It is kind of a, it will kind of be in the elements, but um, I plan on taking the stereo out in the winter months and things like that. And it will, it will mostly be inside. It'll only be outside, you know, when we're using it, which is not that much. So just a little bit about the different um, wire connection methods and shrink tube and kind of how it all works. So what's your guys' favorite method of connecting wires? Uh, I showed a few of the ones I like, but put down in the comments your favorite one. So if you're just catching this series or did not watch the previous video, I got a set of six and a half inch kicker marine speakers. Uh, so thank you and payment for doing a job on a boat. Uh, we're gonna use those for the easy go today. Um, let me catch you up on kind of the plan here. So previously we got the Alpine stereo in mounted uh, in the correct spot. We got the wires ran. Uh, I did hook up some temporary speakers. Um, just to make sure everything was working, but now we're going to go ahead and build an enclosure. So I chose this area back here. We've got a little space here. I'm going to stick with the baskets. Uh, this thing has seen its last round of golf, but uh, for toting around down at the lake, this will be perfect. I want something that I can remove. I don't want to leave the stereo in the dash up there, and I don't want to leave the speakers in in the off season when it's a little colder. I want to be able to take these items out. So when we get over back over the bench and look at the materials, I'll I'll show you kind of some of the some of the things that I purchased to make it easy to take in and out. So on the easy go, there are ways to add speakers in different spots. They make pods that fit right here. I didn't really like those. I like to be able to use a horn button, and they're not going to necessarily block the brake pedal, but they're going to be in the way. So they make pods that go here and there. They're pretty cheap. Uh, they bolt right in. They'll certainly work. I've seen people have blocked off the uh, storage compartments here and put them in there. I like having the storage compartments. They do make overhead pods that um, they make one specifically for the easy go I believe that goes right up here. Um, again I wanted mine to be removable so we're gonna go with the space right behind the seat back here make a little custom enclosure that is removable as mentioned. So as most of you probably know, this is a budget channel. I tend to use materials that I have around, uh, like the speakers, the stereos, wire, etc. So uh, anyone can use plywood uh, for an for a enclosure this small. You can certainly use that. Don't know if I'd recommend it if you're doing subwoofers or something bigger like that that need a very sealed up and solid enclosure, but certainly can use plywood. Uh, if you want to have a bad day, you can use chipboard. Wouldn't recommend it to anyone. The stuff, uh, if you try to drive a screw in it, which is really the only way to do it, it's sometimes a little too hard with all the wood glue in it to nail it together with like a brad nailer. Um, you're gonna, you're just gonna have a bad day. This stuff crumbles apart. Don't use this stuff. Uh, certainly can use plywood. This is 5 8 marine. Um, I just don't have enough of this laying around, but what I do have is MDF. So medium density fiberboard MDF is really just a whole bunch of sawdust I think kind of glued together but it's relatively strong and it does well with brad nails it's really easy to work with which is probably mostly why it's most popular in like the car audio industry for subwoofer boxes things like that but I have a half a sheet here which will be way more than enough than what we need so we're going with MDF for this job so for this job I picked up a four pin trailer connector 
Nobody really uses these things anymore, particularly the round ones. I like it just because it has a quick disconnect, so we have a receptacle and a plug uh, that will we'll put the receptacle in the box and the plug will just hang loosely. Uh, for an audiophile quality stereo system, I would definitely not recommend sending us a, uh, a sound channel through this type of connector, but it'll do good enough for what we're trying to do with the golf cart. We just want to be able to listen to some music while we're driving back and forth around the lake. But uh, this will this will definitely work. It's cheap. I think I paid like seven bucks for this thing for both ends of it. So we're going with that to have a quick disconnect. Uh, I do like to cover wires uh, wherever I can. So there will be the, uh, the plug-in connector and there'll be a pigtail behind that sticking out from the golf cart. So I haven't decided yet. Uh, you can use your standard split room loom, excuse me. Uh, this stuff's like three bucks. Um, bought this uh, local hardware store pretty cheap. Uh, I have not used this stuff much before. Uh, maybe I'll dig it out later, but this is kind of a, a mesh type of loom here and it's, it's plastic. So I bought some of this. Uh, it doesn't offer quite as much protection. You can see the wires in it. It's more to just hold things together. Whereas the split loom here will give some protection against the elements and, and liquids and things like that. As long as it doesn't get full of liquid, then it kind of does the back, the, the opposite effect. But uh, those two items, uh, somewhat optional, guys, if you just want your wires to hang out, you don't have to do that. And then I got a piece of subwoofer, subwoofer box carpet. Uh, this was 10 bucks or so on Amazon. Uh, we use this to wrap the enclosure once we have it built. So let's go get some measurements, uh, start cutting some wood. For this job, I'm going to, I'm going to use hand tools. I have nice, accurate table saws, but again, trying to do this on a budget and cheap for you guys. So. I'll show you some tricks that I use to cut very straight with, uh, with, without a table saw. You're just using a hand saw. So real quick, a uh, few dimensions, uh, 17 and three quarters across. We're going to go eight inches deep, seven and a half tall. It's going to be pretty narrow with the speaker grills, but it will work. Uh, speakers and grills are seven inches. So we'll have just a tiny gap at the top and bottom, but planning ahead here, I want this to slide in and out without having to take a bunch of stuff apart. Uh, I made it about as wide as I possibly could because I want to make some mounts for it that go down on each side of it and mount it down solidly to the cart. So let's get started cutting some lumber. So for today, I'm just going to use my cordless 20 volt D-Walt circular saw with whatever blade is in it. Um, no battery right now, so safe. Uh, please don't do this with batteries in it. You do not want to mangle your hands while making this measurement. But a little pro tip, I'm really roughing it, everyone. I got my... 30 inch T-square and a 36 inch ruler. Normally I have all kinds of aluminum steel rulers, level straight edges, but I have those down at the lake. So this is all I have to measure with today, but um, maybe emulating those who don't have tons of tools. So uh, pro tip, what I like to do is measure from the blade over to the edge of the uh, fence slider on the saw here. So we have exactly four inches. So. I take that measurement, and I don't know if I got that well, we should measure from the edge of the tooth, uh, the widest part of the tooth, but definitely four inches there. So when you're measuring onto your board, uh, for the width here, I've measured out 17 and a half inches, and then I measured 21 and a half inches, added four inches. I'm gonna set a fence here. Um, I'll basically put a straight edge, the length there, and then this will cut consistently and straight uh, the, my 17 and 3 quarters. I'll need multiple pieces out of that, so I'll have to reset and remeasure uh, to add the 4 inches. But I prefer to do it. The DeWalt saw um, has the blade really close on one side. Uh, so it's uh, it, for those who use have used older circular saws, it's just a little weird the way it's set up. But uh, adding the 4 inches for the fence, I'll clamp down a straight edge from each end there and then I'll just cut this and it'll be straight as an arrow and I'll continue that but as far as measurements measurements and dimensions I'm just going to go ahead and cut 17 and three quarters across I'm going to need a I'll need a front plate a back plate a top and a bottom and then I have to cut two smaller pieces for the sides let's cut them out of the scrap but I should be able to just use this section of this four by four sheet here so whatever's left over is left over and we still have a square piece left over so I'm going to set up a tripod, start doing some cut measuring and cutting, and we'll be back once we have all the measurements uh, made and all of the cuts made. All 
Okay, back inside after a couple of bloopers and mishaps, we have a front, a back, a top, a bottom, and a left and right side. So, as everyone probably noticed, I originally went with the idea of setting up the fence four inches from the blade on the long side. Obviously, the motor on the saw was in the way, so I ended up adjusting. This particular saw is inch and an eighth. Again, batteries out to not mangle our hands, but uh, inch and an eighth from the blade on this side, and that's what I ended up doing. I don't know if anybody caught it, but I wasn't actually measuring for the measurement that I needed. I just measured, took uh, the measurement I needed, and added an inch and an eighth to it and set up the fence and ripped it right off. So I didn't have to mark it twice, but uh, worked out pretty well. We got a, again, a top of bottom, left, or, or excuse me, front back, top bottom, left and right. Out of that piece we ripped all the way off of there. Uh, this is our scrap, we've got one little piece and we've got one section left. So next we'll start putting it together. How I like to do these is use these ancient clamps I bought at a thrift store, I don't know how long ago, but Essentially, you just clamp everything in there perfectly. We'll go back and uh, I just have it dry fit right now, make sure everything's lining up, which it sure is. Uh, using that fence really worked. Everything's plumb level square and ready to go. So I will go back and put in just a tiny bit of glue in the joint and then we'll fire up the little mighty boss stitch air compressor and we'll essentially, uh, we will brad nail this together. So the clamps will be in the way for the few uh, on the edges, but we should be able to, actually, I think it will be okay, but I'll put another clamp up here just to hold everything perfectly straight before we nail it. And then we'll nail one, probably leave the first set of clamps on, and then we'll go to the next one, and then keep going around the circle till we have the inner structure. And then I've built it, so essentially the top and the sides are kind of the box, and then the front and the, the back go uh, flush mount. So. You don't see really any seams, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this can be hidden underneath of a basket anyway, but uh, it's typically how I've always done it. Built a frame and then a top and bottom or front and back plate, depending on how you do it. Uh, so I'll come back once we've got a little bit of it nailed together. All right, we've got the first joint together, no big deal. Use the clamp on the top, clamp on the bottom, made sure everything lined up perfectly. Put a little bit of wood glue in there for demonstration. I have just the lightest little skim coat ready for the next next side here so don't have to go crazy with the brads I just put in four we'll really nail everything home when we put the top plate on but just using one inch brads on a you know cheap $20 brad nailer here no big deal uh, say what you want about these cheap tools if you don't use them a lot they work and uh, they work when you need them too so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, keep going around and I'll come back when we've got the inner structure done all right we've got the inner structure all glued together, we've got some brad nails in it, and we're going to leave it in the clamps for that to set up for a little bit. So while we're doing that, uh, exercise in making sure that we get the center of each speaker centered, so it looks uh, nice and centered, up and down, left and right. Uh, what I like to do, so the two speakers, we basically split it into two separate measurements. So we have written here 17 and 3 quarters, half of that is 8 and 7 eighths, so I marked that top and bottom, made a line there. Then we took the eight and seven eighths, divided that in half, we got four and seven sixteenths, so that's our line here in this half, and then our line again here in this half. And then it's seven and a half tall, so half of that is three and three quarters. So you can certainly do all this if you're good at fraction math. I am not, so I cheat, and on my phone use a fraction calculator. So we ended up with eight and seven eighths for the midway point, and then for each one of those, we ended up four and seven sixteenths. So mark that all out. That will uh, help you find your center for each speaker. So a little trick I learned a long time ago. We need five and a quarter, uh, a hole size for the speaker to fit in. Got quite a bit of meat on that outer edge, so. Uh, it actually measures about five and an eighth. We want to give ourselves a little bit of room. So half of that is two and five eighths. So trick I learned a really long time ago, uh, take a tiny drill bit, center drill the hole. Um, and then in a piece of plate, piece of wood, I have this piece of aluminum I've drilled all kinds of holes in, but essentially you do a pivot point with the radius. So I've drilled the hole here that is two and five eighths. And now what I'm able to do is take pencil and essentially draw the entire circle if it'll stay put. So run that around a couple of times and uh, just pivot it on the drill bit. Just put it down in the pilot hole and essentially there you go. We, we should have a 
five and a quarter circle. We can check it here real quick, but we ought to be pretty doggone close. So yeah, we're right at right at five and a quarter. So um, neat little pro tip. Uh, I just like these little skinny little pieces of aluminum. I have a bunch left over from when I used to race many many years ago. So I'm sure most of you saw my doors. Used to rate dirt or excuse me race dirt modifieds. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't very good, but it was fun. So. I have a bunch of this aluminum left over and I use little scraps for things like that. So a little pro tip, uh, I'm going to draw the other one. Uh, I'll drill a pilot hole for a jigsaw and then we'll go ahead and run a jigsaw around. Uh, for a lot of installations, particularly the ones that I do on my little stereos, uh, like the side one here, I have a hole saw set up for a five and a quarter speaker, which is much, much easier, but five and a quarter hole saw uh, is probably going to be, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks. So, uh, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. We'll drill a 3 8 or larger hole and take it outside and cut around the perimeter. Okay, went out uh, the jigsaw, drilled a couple of half-inch holes, that was what I found, and we got a front plate. Uh, cleaned up the inner edges with file real quick. Uh, next thing, always dry fit the speakers, so let me use this just to straddle it for a moment here. Try to anyway. Nope. Get it over there. Let's grab our speaker here and see how it does. So always want to try to dry fit just to make sure they fit down in there flush. They go right in. Everything seems to be fitting. So I always tend to cut this just a skosh oversized. Um, depending on how much room you have, uh, these particular kickers have a real big flange around the outside. See there's probably excess of at least five eighths all the way around. And the screw holes are way out here on the edges instead of real close. So we had plenty of room to work with, so I made this a little bigger than it needed to be. That gives you a little bit of misadjustment too. You can slide the speaker back and forth in the plate like I, I'm showing there, but you can get everything perfectly lined up. So everything fits. Next step, we're gonna go ahead and finish the box. I'll slap the front pack on. Uh, really no rocket science there, guys. Just line everything up. I'll use these clamps to hold it in place while I nail it, but I'll be back once we have the front and back on and we'll go ahead and start working on our uh, trailer connector. Clamps are off, front and back is on and it is looking good. I don't mean to brag, but these are all pretty tight. There's really only one thing that went wrong and we're, we're just an eighth of an inch short on the back plate. I knew that. Uh, when I was setting up the fence, I, uh, I measured incorrectly. I measured an inch. I needed an inch and an eighth. So I knew this piece was going to be a little short. So he deliberately became the back, but everything else lines up about as good as if I had to cut it with a table saw. So apparently I'm a little too good at not having nice tools. I will say that having a table saw, chop saw, and you know, hole saws and all the stuff to do it, uh, or a router, you can cut holes or cut straight lines with a router too. Uh, routers make a big mess, sawdust everywhere, but uh, I got so good at doing this stuff without um, fancy tools that like, apparently I'm still pretty good at it. I mean, the, everything lines up really, really good. It's kind of a, kind of a dare I say, cute little subwoofer box almost. But essentially, you know, if we're doing subwoofers, we'd probably put a brace in between there, depending on the woofer. You know, we could do a ported box. It's just a little tiny little sealed box for uh, two little speakers. So we're going to dry fit it and then start uh, drilling for the connector and then we can wrap it in carpet, put the speakers in and try it out. So the dry fit looks pretty good. Um, it is just as wide, a uh, little undersized on either side of kind of the, the seat supports or the seat rest support. Um, it slid in. It was a little snug against the bottom of this basket here, but it will go. It fills up the space. Might have to do something cool on the back here. Uh, we'll see. But uh, next thing, like I said, I need to mount the receptacle for the speaker wires. I think I'm going to do that somewhere right down in here. So it'll plug into the box right in there. I'll draw that up. I threw a little tape on it just to keep glue off of the paint. But uh, overall fits pretty good. One thing that I did not do, which won't be a huge issue, um, I normally, especially when I'm fitting things in a tight spot, I did it on side to side, but for some reason I didn't adjust up and down. The carpet will take up a little bit of space. It'll just be a tight squeeze to slide it in there, but once it's in there, no big deal. I'm going to figure out how exactly I'm going to mount it down. Um, I'm thinking maybe this is, a, this is a blind threaded hole here to mount something or other, but 
I might just drill through that and just run a screw into it. I mean, it's just, it's got to stay put. That's the important piece. Get a better shot at that. Yeah, this is a mount for something or other, but uh, that may work, but so far so good. Um, mounts right in there. It'll look great in black carpet. It'll look like it'll probably, probably looks like it'll belong there with, you know, the black accents we already have. So uh, let's get it marked and drilled for the quick disconnect and get her carpeted and wired up. So we have the carpet out on the bench here. We have our box ready, but I want to talk to you about a different box. The nice folks over at LZ Fan Golf sent me this charger to uh, for free to take a look at and talk to all of you about. Since I have a EasyGo TXT, uh, this charger is directly for the EasyGo TXT. They want me to do an unboxing and talk about some of the features. So here we go. So they're on Amazon. I will put a link in the description for for this charger specifically. But as you can see, I have not. I have not opened it yet, so in a box inside of a box here, but so as I understand, the charger is waterproof. First thing I notice is, is it's pretty small. Um, it's not too heavy either. So we can figure out how to open this thing. There we go. Got a little more tape here. So open it up, we got uh, instructions. There is a optional, I looked on at their Amazon listing a little bit prior to filming this, so there is an optional handle that we can bolt onto the top here, I'll come back to that. Uh, but here's the charger, it is set up for the D-shape uh, charging plug, common on the EasyGo TXT, just like, uh, just like I have. Uh, it has dual methods to where you hook it up. You can hook it directly to the battery. This one is for 36 volt. So if you don't have an EasyGo TXT, you can still use this uh, charger. You just wouldn't use the EasyGo one. You'd use it on any other 36 volt uh, golf charger, but, or excuse me, golf cart charger. So the unit here is very compact in comparison to many others. So here is, here it is. Uh, close-up shot there but see I can hold that in one hand uh, it is waterproof um, comes with both cables uh, very lightweight um, it does have the, the quick connect so you can select which end you want to put on it if we want to go with the easy go end we just shove that right in here Make sure we get it in there properly yep just like that and screw down the connector and we're set up for a 36 volt easy go or if we don't have a 36 volt easy go, we can hardwire this to our battery system and then we can basically bring in the charger. Again, a quick connect here and uh, we'll be uh, ready, ready to charge any other one. So there we go. So run that in, screw it in, and now we just have our pigtail ends. We'll leave this connected to the golf cart and then unhook this uh, if we so choose and leave it as part of the golf cart, take the charger away. So uh, I really like this thing. When I bought the golf cart um, and even the previous golf cart I had, um, both of them had just enormous chargers and I'll, and I'll show you here so I can lift it. Holy cow. So this charger right here is the one that came with my easy go. It's a 36 volt. This thing's got to weigh 35, 45 pounds. Whereas the LZ fan one here, I can pick up one handed, I can hold it in one hand, I can hold it in the palm of my hand. It's much more portable. Uh, where I'm going to be keeping my golf cart, um, it won't be uh, super close to a plug-in, so, or really a place where I can store the charger. So I'm going to have to store, I would, would have to store this charger uh, somewhere else, probably 60 feet away. So I'd have to lug this thing in and out all the time. With the LZ fan charger here, very lightweight, very portable very easy to carry. So again, I will have an affiliate link down in the description uh, to Amazon. Encourage you to check this out and appreciate uh, LZ Fan for sending me this charger. Back to the video. Back on the box here, uh, have the carpet laid out. There's probably a hundred different ways that people prefer to do this. I have my way, others have their way. Uh, I just like to wrap it kind of like a Christmas gift. So 
I'll get it lined up basically somewhat in the area of where it will lay. And what I like to do is uh, just kind of roll it out incrementally, just like I showed there. I'll, I like to use uh, Super 77 or similar glue. Probably have some right here. Yep. Uh, right now it's Gorilla Glue. It's what I could get my hands on. But uh, follow the instructions on whatever kind of spray glue you're using. You can use staples. That works too. Um, staples don't always go deep enough. They don't always adhere to carpet super well. Sometimes you're forced to use staples. This is nice, very thin. Uh, a subwoofer box carpet, that's what it was made for. It's very, very thin. It's very flexible and easy to work with. If, you, if what you have laying around is like outdoor carpet, you probably have to shove some staples in that. Uh, staples doesn't work, don't, or excuse me, staples do not work well for this type of carpet. So uh, what I like to do, like I said, is kind of roll it out, spray it on the carpet itself, spray it on the box. Uh, Wipe it, you know, basically give it a little time to tack up and uh, pull it up there and just kind of wipe any air bubbles out and then uh, essentially spray the next spot and just keep going until you have all four sides done. Then you can trim the side, uh, trim the excess off uh, and then start wrapping your corners. There's about a hundred different ways to wrap corners. Um, I have good days and bad days with wrapping sub box corners. There are certainly guy, uh, guys and maybe gals out there that are really good experts at it. That's not me. Um, I can do a pretty good job most of the time, but every once in a while it just doesn't quite line up. But I'll try to take my time, do the best I can. So. So that's how it's done. Uh, I'm not an expert at this. I never have been, especially with dark colored carpet. Unfortunately, you can see my overspray of glue, but uh, it's black. It's on the side. No one's going to see it. So I get the other one wrapped up and we'll be back. Back to the cart here, we have the uh, plug in connector wired up. Uh, not much to it, really. Pretty self explanatory. You're just wire in the four pins, you have to keep track of which ones are positive and negative and how they line up at the other end, but uh, I'm probably just going to leave this cover off for right now. I really don't want to drill a hole in anything. I might end up just putting a notch here so this wire can slip through, but for the moment there'll just be a gap there behind the seat where nobody really sees anyway. So uh, this is all uh, wired up and ready to be plugged in. Back over here at the bench, we do have the carpeting finished on the box itself. I have the receptacle wired, I have the speakers in. Um, these ones are a little weird. They had a pigtail on them, so uh, butt connected those together. So we got a whole bunch of wire there, but uh, essentially uh, we've got everything pretty well done. Uh, carpet on the box turned out okay. Of course, the second side looks way better than the first side, but hey, I'm not an expert in that, so I'm not gonna show a bunch of detail. Uh, it's one of the things in or audio that I just I never really mastered, but the wiring piece of it, the picking of components, I'm pretty good at. So I'm going to get the grills slapped on these, uh, get them screwed in, and then it's time to fit it up and make sure they work. So for the moment, we're connected to uh, another temporary power source. My tiny batteries are nearly dead, but uh, we got the speaker box in there. So one unintended uh, item here, the receptacle for the four pin plug stuck out enough to where it just uh, it just barely wouldn't clear the frame right here so I ended up taking that loose and taking the screws out uh, just kind of sliding the harness around the corner sneaking it through put the screws back in but it's in there it looks uh, pretty natural to me I think uh, good use of space that wasn't otherwise used but uh, built the box a little big but I wanted it to kind of fill that gap in there so it's all in. Uh, last thing to do uh, is just play a little royalty-free music for you and test it out.
for watching this episode of Cars with Corey, part two of our budget stereo install on my 98 EasyGo TXT. Got the speaker box done, got a quick connect done, got everything carpeted up. Uh, everything works, sounds pretty good. Um, also got an opportunity to review a charger. I really like the idea of it being super light compared to the one I have, so let me know what you think about that. Let me know what you thought of uh, the golf cart series here. Don't do a whole lot of work on golf carts, but they're pretty easy to work on, and I understand them pretty well. So I uh, appreciate all of you viewers out there. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it even more if you'd like, share, comment, subscribe. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.